So my name is Michael Nolan. I, I don't have enough cards for everyone today, but I am interested in talking to anyone about any specific issues you have offline, so take a note of that if you want to talk to me, all right? Um, so Angela had mentioned earlier already some of the areas we're looking at in Intel. I mean, we're, we're, um, it's, we're in the project, we're looking at like the preservation of software and how that can be done and rerunning these applications in the future. Um, but today, what, what I want to talk to you about is um, something a bit more specific. I want to give you a kind of a, the infrastructure perspective, so like why you're Intel interested in this. Um, the easiest way to relate that is something that I often say to people, is Intel is a technology company. So our future is all about people using technology to access information. We are all aware, hopefully after today, about how technology can become a barrier to accessing information. So it's not exactly in Intel's interests if, that, if um, people start to think of technology in that way. So that's our motivator, and I'm going to give you the, the infrastructure perspective on that. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk to you about um, is what you can do today, um, some best practices and archival approaches. So I know from talking to some of you already, um, some of you are doing some of these things, some of you work in those areas, but for other people it might be just an interesting um, kind of high level overview of what your IT guys are struggling with. All right, so I, I'm not, it's not going to be too technical, so I hope I don't lose anybody. But if anyone has any questions, just put up your hand. I'm happy to take questions during it. And if I somehow manage to finish on time, which would be a first, then I'll take a few questions at the end as well. So I'll start everyone off with just a couple of definitions. Um, so just in case people don't realize what I mean when I mean talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure is all of the components, all the hardware that sits behind the business process. So it's things like uh, servers, your laptops, your network switches, um, your storage systems, those are all infrastructure uh, resources. Um, when we talk about architectures, what you're doing is arranging those resources in a specific way to meet or deliver a specific goal you have. So if you will, the, the kind of analogy is your, your infrastructure or like your Lego blocks, right? And you're trying to build a house or something with your Lego, so you've got to put them together in a certain way. And of course, there's many different arrangements that those Lego blocks could be put together to make many different sorts of houses. So some, some of the things, of course, we know with technology, we're not standing still at any point. So we're moving in lots of different vectors at the same time. Uh, one of those vectors is, in, I'm going to talk about four of them here. One of them is in like uh, the form factors that you're looking at. So if we roll it back a few years ago, you can see we had things like, um, you know, tower, towers were predominantly the type of form factor you see, so very much like uh, what you'd have with a PC these days. Uh, they went to, like, ra these are all types of server formats. Um, they've gone into rack-mounted servers where they're getting more dense, and now we have all these blades and microservers becoming very popular. Um, they're all just incre getting increasingly denser formats, same as you see with your laptops going down to mobile devices. It's the same trend with some of these back-end infrastructure systems. Another vector that you see IT evolution happening in is in the, the architectures themselves. Again, rolling back a few years, um, you've got mainframes and that type of thing. Today, there's a whole pleasure at client-server, great high-performance computer. Um, compute um, ser service oriented architectures and cloud right they're all they're all basically different ways of arranging those Lego blocks that I was talking about earlier this one <laughs> this one doesn't work so well I think with the Lego analogy I've been using but what we're talking about here is the kind of underlying technologies and standards that are changing all the time and I've listed a few of them here I'm not going to explain them in, in a lot of detail a lot of these are kind of uh, network type ones but these are all fundamental building block technologies that are behind all of the IT systems you use today. And these things change over time. They, there's newer versions of them, they become obsolete. And if you're preserving business processes for the long term, all of this is a problem for you, is what I'm trying to get across to people. All right. So, so at some point in time when we're designing IT systems, though, we have to kind of put a, a stake in the ground and say, right, I'm going to implement this system. We can't be forever thinking about all of these different um, 
options that we have available to us for building our architectures and implementing our applications. So at some point, you have to make a decision, well, what type of servers am I going to buy? What type of applications and technologies am I going to build my application on? And all too often, uh, the focus is on getting that system up and running as soon as you, po you can. And I kind of just pose the question, like, is, is success in that kind of scenario any given combination of architecture that will, will work, or should we kind of be expecting a little bit more? And I'm going to tell you what that little bit more is. I won't leave you hanging for too long. All right, but all too often, I think as people designing applications, we just want to satisfy the immediate need of the user. And that's a problem when it comes to digital preservation. All right, so this, this one, I was, if I was lost to anyone, I was hoping this might wake people up. But what we've got here is, um, this is the, the reason why um, we have these kind of problems with technology evolution. It's not that evolution is a bad thing, otherwise none of us would be here. But it's this communication problem when you have rapid IT evolution. It's the pace of computer evolution that's the problem here, not the fundamental of evolution itself. So no more than if we were trying to speak to one of our ancient ancestors, we're probably not likely to get very effective communication going on here. It's probably unlikely to happen at this level as well. The difference is we're going to see that in our lifetime. You're not going to see that too often. <clears throat> so I have some real world problems um, to try and bring it home for some people. Um, some people will understand these in already. They'll they'll know about it, but it, they might be more interesting for people that don't have the, an IT background. So um, you may or may not have heard of um, this story about NASA. So prior to the 1969 moon landing, uh, NASA were sending satellites by the moon and taking photos, trying to find a good spot for the landing. They ended up building a, a whole a huge archive of photos um, at a point in time of the moon. Those photos were relayed back. They were processed by the, the um, orbiter itself and relayed back, transmitted back to Earth where they were rendered in newspapers and, and all that type of thing. But a couple of guys at NASA had the bright idea of as they were coming back, we'll save these off the tapes. So they archived them off onto these tapes. That's what you're seeing here. And they forgot about them. All right, so the only kind of uh, records that people had in the public of them was the images that were broadcast at the time, which was a very small subset. Now, um, we, I hope we'll make these slides available afterwards, but if we don't, I'll, I'll, I'll get these, these links sent out to you to go and have a look. The amount of photos that are up on this are, and the detail in them is phenomenal. These are all high-res photos, and one of them recently won a photo of the year, like when, when they found it in the archive. It was very, it was, it, was like showing um, what appeared to be mountains almost in 3D on the moon when they were looking at it. They're of huge interest, right? You can see the kind of um, how interesting these could be to have them back, but they're no good sitting on these tapes. Now, what happened in this case was NASA went and um, hired out a lo an abandoned McDonald's near to their site, and they brought, they spent a couple of months going through all these tapes, bringing back all the photos at great expense. They couldn't find um, devices to read these tapes. They didn't know the formats that the photos were in. They had loads of problems. So if this is what ha and like NASA are generally accepted as being pretty smart people. So if we can, if this can happen to NASA, imagine what can happen to the rest of us. So you, you need to think about preservation when you're when you're uh, generating data. All right. So that's that stuff. The, the second example I have is more, a more current one, well, in, insofar as uh, any of these problems can be current. So there was a company that I came across here. Um, I don't know if I named them here, probably do, why not sure. Um, so they had, they had, um, these, they had 110,000 of these tapes. Um, they were on a particular IBM cartridge that had been introduced in 1995 and of course no longer manufactured. Uh, so they couldn't read the data, but they knew there was important information on it that they wanted to get back. They went and looked at how they might do that, moving it onto newer media, onto disk, maybe using it, moving it onto a newer type of tape. They ended up having to go through a very expensive process with a, a consultant company, an Australian company called Spectrum Data. It took 18 people, 11 months, 
working in um, India, which is where the, the company that had the problem was located, to get that information back. So 11 petabytes of data that they wanted to get back. It wasn't cheap. So if you're an IT guy and you have a, an archive of these tapes sitting somewhere and you're worried that it might be want, needed someday in the future, it's better to do it before these kind of timelines start happening, right? If, like every every couple of years, you need to be rotating the, that media to keep it current, or you're going to have a big problem down the line.